Hi listeners, Jason here. We are excited to finally announce registrations for the biggest psych health and safety community event ever. The inaugural The Psych Health and Safety Conference will be held at the Sofitel Wentworth, Sydney, June 19 to 20, 2024, and offer concurrent virtual attendance. It'll feature live podcast recordings with OG researchers, including Christina Maslak and Michael Leiter of Burnout fame, Psych Health and Safety USA podcast host, I, David Daniels, Australian super experts, including the likes of David Burrows, a special 10 year anniversary integrated approaches to workplace mental health panel with authors, Tony LaMontagna, Angela Martin and Kat Page, handpicked case studies from organizations doing it well, and a very special interview with plaintiff Zaggy Kozarov by Catherine Donlop on that High Court case, which we previously covered on the podcast. This event will sell out. Get in quick to secure tickets at early bird prices for the two-day conference, pre-conference masterclasses, and the VIP dinner. The first 200 in-person registrations also get a copy of her latest book, The Burnout Challenge, signed by Christina Maslach herself. Find out more and register at www.psychhealthandsafetyconference.com. Now, on to this episode. Bringing psychological health and safety to the forefront in the United States will take multiple voices through multiple forms of communication. We'll talk with a consultant, psychological safety researcher, and LinkedIn top voice who's built a business focused on mindfulness-based stress management practices. Up next on this episode of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. From Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. As workplace mental health has become a global priority, there's a greater focus on addressing psychosocial hazards. Each episode, we look at psychological safety from an occupational health and safety perspective. Let's talk psych health and safety. Welcome to this week's Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. I'm your host, Dr. I. David Daniels. I want to thank you for tuning in. Each week, we seek to increase awareness of the importance of psychological health and safety by learning from the lived experiences, research, and expertise of our guests, as well as advocating strategies to reduce harm and minimize vulnerability to psychosocial hazards in the American workplace. So the Great Resignation, which started in 2021, was marked by a mass exodus of workers in the wake of the pandemic, when employees began to rethink their priorities and consider their work-life balance. Some employees left their jobs mainly due to low pay, lack of career advancement, or low psychological safety. The wave of resignation subsequently extended into 2022, where more than 50 million workers tendered resignations, breaking the $47.8 million record set, uh, million record, Uh, in 2021. Since then, the big quit peak has subsided just a bit, but the rate of workers leaving their jobs has eased, yet the focus on psychological safety has certainly increased. So there's a thirst for more information and support in psychological safety. And there's an increased need for more information, resources, strategy, and support. So my guest is certainly up to the challenge. And uh, you'll hear more as we start and continue this conversation. And I tend to start these episodes with an introduction of my guest by my guest with a question like this. So who is Amanda Muhammad? Well, first of all, I just want to thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Um, Yes, my name is Amanda Muhammad, and I am a mindfulness-based stress management and psychological safety consultant in Dallas, Texas, well, just north of Dallas in a city called Plano. Um, And so I am a woman (laughs) who loves to see people maximizing their potential and who loves to see people just, you know, owning the things that they desire and living life in a way that fulfills them personally and professionally. And, you know, I strive to bring that understanding and desire into the workplace as well, knowing that we spend uh, more time sometimes with our coworkers than we do with our own family and with our own friends. And so if we're going to show up in these places, how can we show up in these places in a way 
that's fruitful for us and for everyone around us. And that's really my mission is to help people explore what that looks like to create better days. I, I call it create a great day at work. Uh, okay. I I have to admit, I have been looking forward to this conversation because we, uh, for for our, our guest I was on, so I was invited to participate in this effort with some folks from Canada, well, with a mutual friend, and uh, and I show up and I go like, who's that lady from like Texas? I got to get to know her. <laughs> so because uh, again, as the podcast has continued, and, and I've shared this more than once, but when I started this, I was there's a part of me that wondered if there were was anybody else in the U.S. who even cared. And slowly but surely, I'm finding out there are a lot of people who care, and I'm having the honor and pleasure of meeting many of them. So. But again, as we you know get into the discussion, uh, one other question I ask everyone who comes on for their uh, their view: uh, What does psychological health and safety mean to you? Ooh, I think you know for me it means the ability to show up in a in a workplace and specifically in a workplace, right, and to be able to you know be who you are authentically, um, and also carry out the gifts that God has given you. Um, without, um, you know, someone like breathing down your neck and trying to, <laughs> and trying to, um, you know, take, take that flow and, and interrupt that from you, you know? So it, it just means to be able to show up in an authentic way and own the gifts that you have. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So, uh, so what, what sparked your interest in this? Cause as I said, this is, this is a fairly new conversation here in the U.S. Uh, it's And people come at it from a variety of different perspectives and, and views. Um, and even some of the folks who are talking about it now, uh, they talk about it in terms of it's kind of a fad. And, and if you really dig into it, they don't necessarily have anything other than they saw someone on YouTube and now they're talking about it. But again, I, I, at least you know, your, your writings and, and uh, the, uh, the things I've seen from you suggest you're kind of into this. I mean, seriously, you, you, you come across as if you are, and I don't know if you really are or not, but you're doing a good job of convincing me that you're into this. So uh, what, what sparked your interest, both as a, you know, and kind of an educational and a business endeavor? You can look at it and talk about it from either perspective or both. Well, yeah, I think, so for one, to your point, I think a lot of times when people hear psychological safety, they're just like, oh yeah, like that sounds great because you have the term psychological and then you have the term safety. So people are thinking, oh, you're considering my mental health, like we're good to go. And to your point, not understanding that it's actually a research-backed concept um, that's been proven to be one of the most important factors to have inside of a workplace. And so my personal um like what personally drew me towards this was actually working in the workplace. And when I graduated, it seemed originally as if everyone around me was experiencing a lot of stress, but there weren't really, really many tools to help us manage it. And I had known from, you know, my experiences in college and just my personal things that I had went through, I had began doing things like breathing exercises and mindfulness practices and learning about different things that I can do that can just help me like move through the day in a different way. I practiced a lot of gratitude. I did a lot of journaling and those things helped me. And I can remember being in multiple roles and people be like, how are you always so, excuse my language, but how are you always so damn happy? And, I, and I, I'd and say, you know, I, I do things outside of work. I take care of myself. I do these different things. So originally my work really started, when you hear me say my title, I always say stress management and psychological safety. And my work started in the stress management space, just understanding that people needed tools to be able to show up and continue showing up in a way that, you know, was fruitful again for them and for everyone around them in a way where they could be engaged in a way where they could be proud of what they were working on and what they're doing and what they're contributing to um, in a way that challenged them in a healthy way um, and just made them feel like they actually brought value into the workplace. And so the more that I studied stress in the workplace, the more that I began to have this conversation because, you know, I'd go in and I would teach employees about tools that they could personally use for managing their stress. 
And then I'd get there and a lot of the conversation would be like, but, you know, I'm getting all of this, like, you know, people are dumping so much on my plate or I have a manager who's just a butthole or I have, you know, all of these other factors. And so I started looking into that. And the more that I started to to learn about really the, I believe, in, in a bi-directional relationship of stress management and psychological safety, the more that I started to kind of see this term and uncover it in my in my studies. And so I studied uh, management leadership in HR and undergrad, organizational leadership for my master's, and now um, business psychology. And so for me, psychological safety really became a marriage of two things that I really cared about, which one was that workplace well-being, that stress management piece. And two was that like business psychology, the psychology of how we create um, healthy workplaces. And so it was this perfect intersection of the two um, that I felt like could easily encompass both. Hmm. Okay. So um, that, that's a, th- that sounds like it was, uh, that, that sounds like the academic part about seeing these concepts out there that seem to make sense that you were able to apply, uh, you know, in your work situation uh, tell me a little bit more about the practical side. So, how how do you how how do you end up doing this uh, as kind of a full time thing? I mean, so uh, it, it sounds like you've had the opportunity to you know to be in organizations and teach other people, and now it looks like you're kind of leading an effort yourself. So, how do how do you get from uh, there to here? So, um, I'm sorry. How did I get from like from yeah, from being in an organization, but not, you you have your own practice now, as opposed to, you know, t- uh, the the terms I use, kind of toiling inside the you know the machine. Uh, it seems like you're you know you've taken some experience there and now are helping others. So talk a little bit about how you made that transition or why you made that transition. I got you. So um, I was saying, you know, several, I had worked in a few different jobs. One was a big corporate company, one was a small private company, and one was a school. And I saw these common themes across all three. The big theme at the time was that many people were experiencing stress and there wasn't many tools and resources for us to manage it. And I had known at the time that my mindfulness practices were making a difference. I began teaching them inside of the classroom uh, to students and also outside of the classroom to teachers and to other professionals and began getting this really great feedback for how much of an um, impact those practices were having on just people's general well-being. And um, so that's what I wanted to focus on, helping other people understand. But the big thing for me was, especially as a, at the time, a private yoga instructor, it was like, okay, what am I supposed to do? Go ask people to change out of their work clothes. And, you know, this is pre-pandemic. So like everybody was like actually in the workplace and, you know, to do yoga. So it became, how can I teach people about practices that they can do right at their desk that can make a difference in, um, you know, just their day-to-day activities? It's not saying I can make your stress go away. It's just saying that there are some different tools and resources that you can use that can help you to navigate these situations in a different way. On the other side of that, as I started to come into psychological safety work more, I also started to see how people respond to things differently, right? So somebody closes their door and, you know, one person feels like it's a personal attack and the other person's like, oh, that person just must want their door closed. So I started to recognize that a lot of you know, the way that we interpret things is based on our own individual experiences and where we are, which is why the bi-directional relationship was so important to me. So starting with the stress management, understanding that a stressed brain is not necessarily a psychologically safe brain. So it was an, it was an easy like transition from stress management into psychological safety because it was like, this is a really foundational concept. If you're not well, How can you go in and, you know, expect other people like, you know, it's just catering to you, which is the American way. Um, (laughs) But like, you know, if if you are showing up in a certain way, um, which you haven't addressed, maybe some of those core triggers or those foundational things, you're not taking care of yourself. The lens in which you see your workplace and your world is just naturally going to be skewed. There's not anything wrong with it. It's just 
what it, it's logic, it's science. It just makes sense that your lens is going to be shifted based on your experiences and the way that you're seeing the world. So if we can start to change the way that we see the world, if we can start to, and that I use my Mako method framework for that, you know, if we're looking at things like journaling and gratitude and breathing exercises, things that have actually been proven to change the way that your brain processes and perceives stressful information, well, then we can ultimately start to change and shift the way that not only we show up in the workplace, but that we also experience the workplace. And so it all just kind of continued to unfold. But what it was, was I saw that gap. I saw that people needed quick things that they could do. I saw that it wasn't realistic to suggest eight hours of sleep to, you know, parents of four. Or, you know, I, I saw that it wasn't realistic to ask educators to take 60 minute yoga classes three times a week when the yoga classes can dang near be as much as the salary you're bringing in. Right. So I wanted to focus on things that people could do that were practical and that were free, um, that would be easy to implement um, into your daily life and into your work environment. And then, you know, with that, too, understanding that you can't control what happens around you. Right. We can sometimes influence it, but we can't control it. And so what we can control is our response to it and the way that we show up and the and what we decide for ourselves. So even in the stress management piece, as you start to learn more about yourself, you start to learn more about what you actually want your life to look like, what you want your work environment to look like. And you start to make decisions that are aligned with that. Sometimes it looks like advocating for yourself. Sometimes it looks like finding a new job. Sometimes it looks like quitting your job and starting a new one, which is what I did. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's learning how to show up for yourself um, and then also learning how that impacts the way that you show up for others. And if we're all doing that, this is, you know, my philosophy. I'm looking at the bi-directional relationship of if we each own what we can do, which is take care of ourselves in the way that we know we need to take care of ourselves and stop um, outsourcing that responsibility, then we can start to have an impact where we're all impacting each other because we're all foundationally taking care of our needs and we're all pouring from our overflow instead of our resentment. Oh boy. Oh, <laughs> there, there, there was a lot there. Um, I, I, I really, really, really like the, the, the focus on uh, starting internally and working externally that I, I, I find that there are a lot of conversations about safety of all types, both physical and psychological, that tend to focus outward first. So the hazards over there, uh, you know, this is uh, this is what we're going to do to change what's going on over there. We're going to move this thing over here. But 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 it is very, 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 very difficult for for me to focus on someone else when I'm struggling myself. That's it, it's just difficult, even. My heart's in the right place. I have the right intent. At least I believe I'm trying to do what's right, but I'm struggling so much myself. And then particularly those who are in positions of responsibility, leadership, however you want to describe it. There's this, well, it's your job. You have to do this. You got to go in. But I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm struggling today. I'm struggling this week. Uh, there's something going on in my life. And I, that has to be dealt with because if it's not, I'm not going to be able to show up for other people. And the, the other point that I just really love that you said, it's I, I, I heard someone say this before and, I, and you said essentially the same thing. We can only help others out of our abundance. If I don't have enough of that, how am I going to give it to somebody? Whatever it is, if I don't have enough food, it's difficult to help someone else like you're on an airplane. Put the mask on yourself first before you try to put a mask on somebody else. And so it just really that's a and it's such an important concept. It gets sometimes described as selfish, sometimes described as you're not a company person. Some, and you know what? I, I'm kind of at the point. Well, that's OK. Um, if however you describe it, but it really is really important. It's so important for me, for all of us to look inward first and to deal with, you know, what's going on with me before I try to, you know, propose a bunch of things to other people. Wow. Absolutely. I think, you know, the concept of selfishness, I take a little bit of a different take on that. I believe to be selfish just means to consider yourself, which most people don't do. Most people show up 
especially when you start working in terms of service and helping professionals. I work with a lot of educators, mental health professionals, right? People who work in in spaces, a lot of nonprofits, people who are, they have hearts of service. And so they tend to skip right past themselves and do all of this work for everyone else at the expense of themselves. And then we wonder why the turnover in those industries is so high, right? And so I encourage people to be more selfish in the way that means step back and consider what it is that you need and tend to that so that you can show up in your role. It's not instead of showing up in your role, it's so that you can do it well. Like nobody wants to show up, I would hope not, that you want to show up and serve a population of people um, and just give them this like fragment and you're very, you know, you want to do your best. And oftentimes like we skip past that. Um, and you know, it's, it's unfortunate because it's the most important and vital industries that we need, right? It is our teachers. It is our mental health professionals. It is our, our doctors. It is the people that take care of us that are experiencing the most depletion, right? And that are talking about the lack of psychological safety too. And a lot of times, you know, people just don't, don't know that there is terminology for what they are experiencing. Um, so I think with psychological safety, yes, it's like that buzzword and people don't understand the like necessarily that it's a research backed concept, but it's also great because it's an entry point because for for a while, just like in my business, I'd work with coaches and I'd, you know, content coaches or, you know, business coaches and strategists, and they would try to push back about the term psychological safety. And I stood firm. One, because I knew that it was a research back term and I had done research in the area. And two, because I knew that people, even though they didn't know what it meant, it opened the door for a conversation because it always piqued interest. Right. And so there's a lot of people that they might not know what it is, but they know when they hear it that they're not experiencing it. And so <laughs> so that, you know, opens the door for a lot. But, yeah, it starts with um, with you. I, I really believe that that's what it is. And that's the approach that I took for stress management as well. Yes, organizations could do a much better job of delegating work. They could do a much better job of communicating. We definitely have to do that work. But we also have to understand that sometimes these things take time. Look at how long it can take us individually to form a new habit. But then we turn around and expect organizations, which is multiple people, with multiple responsibilities, people they have to answer to, to turn around and make a change really quickly. So I focus on, look, it might take them some time. What can I do to create the best environment and experience possible for myself while this is happening? And what would be important to me is to know that there are intentional things that are happening, but that it's also communicated that, hey, this might take some time. We might not get it right the first time. We're trying to implement some changes. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, it's, it starts with you and take, and taking that step back and taking accountability and responsibility for your own well being. It's not saying these things aren't happening or dismissing or giving an organization a pass, but like, this is your life. It is. You it know? Is. Yeah. Just so, so practical, so practical. Uh, but again, another Something you were saying earlier that, you know, again, piques my interest is uh, looking for approaches, for strategies, for tactics that are practical for people. Because I, I find that uh, a lot of times organizations, first of all, they get in this conversation uh, in a kind of a response kind of mode. Something happened and now we bring in the yoga instructor, or the, you know, the, the whatever, because something's happened already. Something tragic has happened. We've had a down year. Something bad has occurred. As opposed to that this is, this is a life practice of mine. This is something that I do all the time and I want to bring it into the workplace and we want to do it together. And so uh, a lot of organizations will, again, get something off the shelf and go, everybody's going to do this. And while that thing may work for a handful of people, may work for the majority, it's not necessarily going to work for everybody. So how do you have individualized approaches that get people heading in a similar direction? And I hesitate to say that they're going to end up at the, even the same place, but we're kind of going in a similar direction. And people, how they get there and when they get there really should be okay. As long as people continue to contribute to our collective goal, 
I mean, people get hired. So businesses get started. People uh, do a job description or don't. Uh, they put an ad in the paper or in the paper. That's really dating myself uh, out, out on the web looking for new people. And they select somebody for a set of skills or something they can contribute to a goal. And then they try to box them in and go, well, we have to do it this way. Here's our policy on this. Here's our policy on that. And we totally lose track of the goal. What is it that this person came to do? Why did we bring them into the team? And how can they be their best selves and accomplish this goal in the way that they do it? Because ultimately, that's when they're going to do their best work. They're going to do it in the way that works for them. And, you know, I, I can hear, even when I say those things, hear the, you know, the sometimes louder than other voices. Well, you know, we don't have time for all that. No, you have time for anything that's important. You just have to make time for it. I mean, if you want to retain your people, you, you're you going to have to make time for it. And the thing is, is I think the time that it takes to find someone to replace these people, the time that it takes to have to go through the lawsuits that you may get, the time that it takes to, you know, the, the way that it's going to impact your bottom line, because you have people that are not in positions, not, not in proper positions, or that are completely worn down. And so their productivity and their engagement is, is, is low. Those things have to be considered as well. I don't think that it's that we have time. I think that it's not comfortable for, to do what we actually have to do, which is to build relationships with the people that we are working with. And like, I think that's what it comes down to. A lot of times, like you said, with psych psychological safety or really a lot of things in the workplace, people try to come in with these blanket approaches and force something else on people, not understanding that you're perpetuating the issue that you had in the first place. People already feel forced. People, forced, people already feel like they don't have any control or any say or any agency in their roles. They feel like they have to show up and do what they have to do so they can keep a roof over their head and take care of their families while things are incredibly, things are changing in the economy. There's a lot of things that are going on. So people are trying to hold on to what they have. And you also have people that will jump in a heartbeat. You know, they have these, some generational issues here too. But like you have to look at your op costs, right? What are your opportunity costs here for what you're choosing not to do or what you're choosing to do? What's going to what's going to benefit on the other side? So the approach that I take when I'm talking to a group about psychological safety is very much so an open discussion about norms, about how we interpret different things, because immediately you start to see the light bulbs go off where it's like, well, I saw it this way. Well, I saw it this way. And then it's the same situation and you start to really easily see, I didn't think about it from that perspective, right? Um, I was on the plane um, coming back from LA like maybe a couple of months ago and I was sitting next to this lady and she found out what I did for a living and she was like, psychological safety. So she goes, so the camera thing, tell me, what, like, what are your thoughts on, you know, turning your camera on in a meeting? And I was like, you know, I can see both sides. Like this is, you know, a thing that a lot of people are talking about. They're tired of always having their camera on. They're tired of the Zoom meetings, you know, whatever. So she chooses to keep her camera off on every single meeting. And so I was like, you know, I can see both sides of it, especially as a facilitator. I can see the value of seeing other people when you're trying to have a conversation because there's something different about like Zoom to me or, you know, any of these platforms and knowing that the person like is there, but the camera's just off versus like a phone call, right? Like there's just a different thing that's there. I'm not quite sure what it is. But I said, you know, for me, like you get to so much of our conversation is not just your words. It's, you know, it's tone, it's body language, it's the expression, it's the affirmation on the other side, the head nods, or the where you can start to pick up on different things from people. So we communicate with so much more than our words. So she was telling me, you know, I just don't like turning my camera on and I don't want to feel forced to do that. That's just who I am, you know, yada, yada, yada. And so I was like, okay, I said, you know, that's your prerogative. If you don't want to turn your camera on, I understand. I said, have you ever thought about what what their reason for why they want the camera on is so important to them. And I wonder if they've taken time to actually understand why that's important to you, because maybe there's an opportunity here for you guys to meet each other in the middle. And she told me when I was started to have that conversation with her, she's like, she took like a deep breath and she's like, you know what? She's like, I have to be honest with you. I'm a little embarrassed. She said, I never really thought about how that might feel to them. 
I was only really thinking about my side of it. And I think that's the unfortunate thing that we're, a lot of us are sitting in. We have people that are showing up to jobs and just looking at their experience and not necessarily how they're contributing to their experience, where that could have easily been a situation where it's like, okay, for these meetings, I may have my camera off. And for this one, I may have it on and not just completely only looking at what I need, but also looking at what we need as a team to function well. Right. Right. So, right. The conversation has to shift into having those relationships and looking at, like, who are these people that I'm working alongside instead of just continuing to force our way, force our thought on people. We can create an environment that actually is, you know, it, it's fertile ground for us to, like, have the relationships and the type of experiences that we want. Do you need more psych health and safety in your life? then head over to the Flourish GX Academy for several free on-demand e-learning courses. If you're an internal professional, follow Flourish GX on Eventbrite to register for any of our free fortnightly interactive webinars. Our flagship professional practice program is also exclusively available for internal professionals. The 12-week course blends theory, applied practice, and interaction with other professionals through live lectures and a monthly community of practice session. Find out more about all these learning opportunities or inquire about a bespoke in-house training at the Flourish DX Academy, www.45003.org. Now back to this episode. So uh, another word I heard you use, you've used it a couple of times, bi-directional, I think is, uh, if I'm interpreting it the same way, I think is really important in this discussion. So as much as I talk about and we've talked about you know, uh, being a little selfish, looking at what's going on with me, understanding myself, that uh, at least I, I'm certainly not saying, I don't think you are either, to suggest that that's the only part of the communication. Because communication between two parties uh, is about both the sender and the receiver, whoever's sending the message and the person. It's not just about, so if I'm sitting in a room kind of talking to myself, uh, even if I'm looking in the mirror, there's there's, I'm looking in the mirror, there's, there's a reflection, there's something that's coming back. And uh, human beings were not really created to be by themselves all of the time, which, which is the reason that the worst thing you could do to a person, if you put a person in prison, the, the thing that's even worse than going to prison is being in isolation. So we're, we're just not designed that way. We're, we're designed to be around other people. So there's a part of me that, that sometimes believes that sometimes the most important thing I can do for myself is for someone else because I need to do something for someone else. And if I want to have a relationship with another person, it can't just be about me. It also has to be about them. And at that point, we, we create an environment so we can enjoy our discussion, our conversation. It can't just be about me because again, I, 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 the, the affirmation I'm looking for, the friendship I'm looking for, the business success I'm looking for, I can't do it by myself. I mean, or, or the things that I can do by myself, I've just limited my opportunities because it's just must be. So I, I think that's a really important point. It's not an either or, it's a both and discussion. Both are important. They are. They are. The, the, so the reason why I say um, you start with yourself is because <laughs> I had a conversation yesterday with a client and she was telling me, you know, a position that they were in and, you know, what training they were looking to do. Um, because a lot of the people on the team, they were saying that they, you know, that they needed more support, but they couldn't articulate what they needed support in. Right. They were saying they didn't feel, you know, comfortable with certain things, but they weren't articulating what it was that they didn't feel comfortable about. It was just a feeling. Right. And not saying just a feeling in a dismissive way. Hear me out. This is why it's important to start with you, because when someone asks you, what is it that you need from them, whether that's personally or professionally, you need to be able to articulate what that is. And so if you don't know yourself, if you don't know what your needs are, how can you talk about you don't have capacity when you don't know what it looks like when you don't have capacity? So it's like when you explore that deeper level of yourself, understanding, OK, these are my values. I really value family. That's why I get so upset when something is thrown on my plate at 445, knowing that I want to leave at five and now I have this pressure, right? And so then you can articulate that. 
And I understand you can get into the whole, I shouldn't have to explain myself, but you shouldn't, you don't have to do anything. But if you want to create healthier relationships, you might want to, right? And that's something that I've had to learn personally and professionally as well. When I can articulate what my needs are, that context creates clarity for the relationships that I that I want to have and that I want to nurture. So yes, it's not about only me and this is what I need. The other thing is as you start to do that work, you can start to have a level of empathy for the other people in the workplace. You might start asking yourself, well, this is what I need. What is it that they need? Or you might start to point out like, man, I've been there before where I didn't I didn't know that or I wasn't taking care of myself. And then I started doing this and started having a different experience. So that's how we can start to show up and serve from our overflow because we have taken care of ourselves. We have acknowledged what it is that we need. And now we can, you know, share that with the workplace. So it's about positioning yourself to be in a better position to experience and contribute to psychological safety. So that's one thing that I always try to talk to people about. It's not just you experiencing it, it's you contributing to it. So, you know, that's how we create psychological safety, right? It's not about what the company does. I believe it's from each little one of us, because at the end of the day, even though it's an overarching company, there are human beings making those decisions. So those human beings, if they're showing up and they're burnt out and they're over and they're not tending to their needs and they're not tending to themselves, the, even as high as they may be in a company, they are still human and they are still, you know, sp- spitting out things without much consideration. Right. So we can all play a role in the psychological safety that we experience at work. Right. So, so I, 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 a couple other t- topics I would love to cover, uh, really from, from this perspective of you, of you sharing information with other folks. So I, I follow your newsletter and, um, and I, it's amazing to me. So I don't consider myself to be a prolific writer. I, I can write. I prefer to have conversations than write. And there's probably some days that that may be a, you know, Perhaps I should write more, but uh, but I, I find that um, you seem to have this this talent for put, putting topics out there again that are very you know yeah I, that kind of makes sense and so how do you determine how do you determine which topics you're going to share with folks in your regular communication? Sure. So one thing that was really helpful is that we have a couple of frameworks that we work off of, right? So we call it the Mako Method Framework. One is one that I came up with. The other one is a is a derivation of another framework by, by Timothy Clark, right? So for Mako Method, um, that is the way that I came to that framework. This will, this will give you some context, but um, I was doing these like stress management trainings. And when I first started, somebody had just asked me, can you do a stress management training? And since I taught mindfulness, I'm like, sure, I can, you know. And but I started doing some research. And so I go in front of these people and I'm like, drink more water, get some sleep. And like they're like falling asleep in the presentation outside of a few different parts that they really got into, which actually was my affirmations part that made that really resonated with people. They had a lot of fun. Uh, my breathing exercises, my gratitude, like those different things. And so I remember after this one training and specifically where I was really talking about the like things that you could do, which were like, you know, just these like standard dry things that really didn't apply to a lot of people. They didn't resonate with people because people didn't have the time to to get eight hours of sleep. People didn't have the resources to take this yoga class, like I said earlier. So I remember just sitting down and saying, I've got to find something that people can do that can be quick because the people that I work with are busy people. They're people that are taking care of kids and care of family members, they're caregivers. And I like serving these people. I love, I like working with people who love what they're doing and they want to figure out ways to show up in a more optimal way. So I was like, I have to find something practical. And that's where I came up with the Mako method, which is about five evidence-based things that you could do throughout the day to manage your stress, all things that have been proven to change the way that we um, process and perceive stressful information. So that came down to breathing exercises, gratitude, journaling, affirmations, and working on your perspective. So that became five topics that I always knew that I could talk about because it came directly from my framework 
and I knew that people liked hearing about them. So usually if it's some type of like stress management content, it's going to come down to one of those mindfulness-based stress management topics. And on the other side with psychological safety, um, you know, following Timothy Clark's model, the only difference is that we believe the stress management is foundational. Once you have that foundational piece of taking care of yourself, of examining your needs and tending to those needs, then we can look at inclusion safety, learner safety, contributor safety, and challenger safety. So those became other things that we could look at. But the most important thing to me was that when I was putting out content, it wasn't just about like me and what I was doing. It was actually giving people things that they could do, really practical tips that if you never hire me in your organization, you could still walk away with value from our content. Originally, it started as, you know, a blog that bloomed. And as we, you know, entered stress management and then it became psychological safety, it just gave us this wide array of topics to talk about. So over the years, I just started tending to that content. Nowadays, you know, six and a half years in, I've gotten more strategic about how that content gets delivered. So we have certain content that goes out certain days. Um, that falls under these like umbrellas of content, which makes it really easy to write instead of just shooting in the dark. But we do kind of have these containers. So it's going to talk to you about something where, you know, why breathing exercises are important or something where you can incorporate breathing exercises. So um, it was originally just me cranking out content. And then over the years, I've had a couple people that have joined the team um, where they have either repurposed content and supported me in that, or I have a copywriter that does a lot of content um, for us now too, using our voice, but we will meet and we'll have strategy over you know, what's important. And then she goes through our content or we'll talk and she'll hear my philosophy and put that into words. So we were producing a lot of content these days. It's all approved by me, but I'll be honest, it's not all written by me, you know? Um, so that's why you say so much. But it is our it is our philosophy, you know. Right, right, right. So I, I you are the first LinkedIn top voice that I've ever met. <laughs> so I, I kind of I kind of had to ask about you know how you know how, how that happens. Uh, I, I as I said, I'm I, I don't consider myself to be a prolific writer who's you know uh, producing content on a regular basis, and so it always fascinates me. Wow, where did they come up with that? Just it's just wonderful to see, and particularly in this space, uh, and, and particularly in this space in this country, because that's where another place I want to go. As I said, we we uh, we had our kind of introduction through a mutual friend up in Canada, who I kind of stumbled across, and it looks like you stumbled across as well. And um, so I, I, it does appear that you've uh, been connected outside of just what's going on in your local area, and have have. You know, started to look around the world for other other activities. How how did that come about? How do you end up talking to people in other countries? Is that just through the business or through your research or a little bit of both? Yeah, um, a, a little bit of all of it. I think the beautiful thing about I have I have my quirks with social media, but one of the beautiful things is it really has connected me with some of my favorite people in the world and um, has gotten me some opportunities that I don't know that I would have had or that I would have, you know, that I would have had without it. Um, The key has been consistency, consistency and adding value. And so, like I said, like it it was always important to me that I wasn't just doing stuff that was just like, look at me, look at me. I might have a picture on there, but like I wanted, I always wanted to be like of service in my space. I wanted people to connect the name Amanda Muhammad or Mako Mindfulness with stress management and eventually with psychological safety. And so I always wanted to just like deliver that value and people know that like when they think stress management, boom, contact Amanda Muhammad. And that's what I get a lot of times on my interviews or not interviews, my like sales calls, right? Um, It's like, yeah, as soon as somebody said stress management, we knew exactly who to reach out to. And so- that's been that's been nice to be able to um, do that that way. But that's how that LinkedIn opportunity came across was just I had been posting for years, years and years and posting value for years. And um, yeah, I had contributed on an article and on the other side of that, they made me a top voice. And so it's been a, it's been really cool. It was like, you know, for for a LinkedIn girl, like that's like a dream come true. 
Um, and one of my big goals this year is to continue growing my LinkedIn and to post on there consistently and leverage some of the resources that they have. You know, now LinkedIn has newsletters and things like that. And so we're, you know, taking advantage of that and just finding different avenues to house all of this like content and resources that we do have um, in a way that's helpful for people. Yeah, uh, again, th- it, it is an important platform, uh, certainly over the last few years. I mean, this, most of the advertising discussion, uh, sharing of what goes on in this podcast happens on LinkedIn. And, and again, the, and, I, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll share, you You may know this, uh, others certainly have, uh, have heard this as well, but the folks uh, that sponsor this podcast are in Australia. And, and so there's, uh, it's something that they picked up on. I had been doing a few things on LinkedIn, but didn't realize kind of the the power and the breadth of the platform itself. And I kind of jumped in with both feet and kind of going along for the ride. But uh, again, it was like I said, just it's just very impressive to see uh, someone who has an experience of their own that they've turned into an opportunity to help others and are continuing to share. And it it doesn't look like it's getting stale. I'll just tell you from someone who, who reads. <laughs> it, it it looks like, oh, yeah, I just hadn't really thought of that, which like there are so many ways to approach the concept of psychological health and safety that it, the opportunities are endless. But I think some of the conversation tends to be kind of limited because people get on a particular track and kind of stick there. And it's just it's very wide ranging. There's a lot of different directions you could go. Uh, my, my discussions about it from the occupational health and safety perspective, I think, are a little bit behind the discussions that are going on in the stress management, mental health type of environment, because there are still safety professionals, people who do traditional safety, who don't believe that psychosocial hazards even exist. They don't look at it that way. Uh, they're still focused on slips, trips, and falls, and those type, which are important. I have to tell you, but what I've discovered is. Pick an occupation. You pick it. Pick an industry. And I can generally, generally find data to support that the biggest issue they're dealing with in terms of injuries and fatalities is psychological in nature, not physical. Uh, Most, as a matter of fact, your chances of dying in construction are four times higher by suicide than all the other things that are being talked about. It's not that the others aren't important. But we're not, as a culture, we've not spent spent enough time talking about, again, to the point you made earlier, about how people feel. And when they say that this doesn't feel right to me, we push past it. Oh, you know, this is this is a tough job. You know, you, you just have to push through it. And I know you're feeling horrible, but keep doing it. And thankfully, as a society, you know, and you mentioned also the generational shifts we're saying, I am just so happy to see, I think I might have been a Gen Zer that was born early because I'm with them. Uh, this idea that I have to go into the workplace and be, you know, mistreated, disrespected, abused, and beat up. I just, I'm just not with that at all. I don't think anybody should have to do that. It doesn't matter what your job is. It doesn't matter. We, we do have a primarily service-based economy anyway. So it makes sense that while I'm serving others, that I feel good myself, that I feel like I'm being served a- at the same time. Why does it have to be either or? How come it can't be both? And so it's just it's wonderful to see the, the, the approach that you're taking. As we uh, start to conclude the conversation, um, tell me a little bit more about um, the ab- about, you know, your company and how if if how, how do you, is it by referral? Do you do a big bunch of ads, do a little bit of both? But it, your company seems to be growing and you seem to have created this space for what you do. Tell me a little bit about, you know, about how you, how, how business is going and and, uh, and and share a little bit about what you all do. Sure. So um, my company is Mako Mindfulness and we are a boutique professional development company. So I facilitate training and deliver a lot of resources, right? So on that same topic, we create a lot of content so that on the other side of our trainings, we can make sure that people can go deeper, that they understand more. Because, you know, sometimes we only have 60 minutes or, you know, two hours with folks. And so we want to make sure that they have resources on the other side of those conversations. 
Um, and so I work with all kinds of companies. People ask me like, oh, do you specialize in an industry? No, like if you've got stress, you can, you know, you've got me, right? And so that's actually, I've really enjoyed that. Um, I've enjoyed not limiting myself because I've been able to work with lots of different types of companies, you know, nonprofits and school districts and big corporate companies across all different industries, different types of teams, tech teams and quality teams and, you know, sales teams. Like that's just been really cool. Um, and what's so interesting is it hasn't had to, I haven't had to like hyper specialize my content because of what I do. Um, most people are experiencing, you know, and, and especially because it, it's so much of it, especially when it comes to psychological safety, is discussion based. They get to come with their stuff. Right. So, you know, I, I really enjoy um, facilitating those trainings and, of course, how to find me. Well, you can definitely find me on LinkedIn, Amanda Muhammad. Um, we post content daily on there um, on both topics of stress management, psychological safety, but also like I, I talk a lot about my entrepreneur journey or share, you know, different testimonials and feel good stories from companies that we work with. Um, and so you can definitely find content there. Um, we also have a blog, makeomindfulness.com, where you can go and learn specifically on different parts of our frameworks. You can dive into more about gratitude, dive into more just different conversations, ideas, things you can do on all of those different topics. Um, we have a plethora of things you can dig into and immediately begin um, implementing. Just easy things, little things to consider. And that's that's what's you know most important to us. Um, so yeah, those are definitely two ways to get in contact with me. I'm also on Instagram at Mako Mindfulness. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you just search us, you can find us and there will be resources there available for you to immediately begin using. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, Matt, and Matt. last. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sure, I was go, ahead. Say, go ahead. We are heavily referral based. Um, so a lot of times our clients, like people that I've worked with, will turn around and refer me to their friends. Um, so a lot of leads do come in through LinkedIn. I don't run ads, um, but it comes in through people seeing that content consistently and, and having that that moment where it's like make uh, stress management. Oh, Amanda Muhammad. It's like safety. Oh, Amanda Muhammad, right? Um, and so you can just fill out that lead form and we start having a conversation about what trainings and resources may be best for your group. Absolutely. Well, thanks, thanks so much for, for sharing some of your valuable time uh, with me and with our listeners and viewers. Uh, we have a, a few of both. Uh, I've learned some things. And that's the, you know, the other really neat thing about having this uh, opportunity is that I, I'm learning myself. I'm just hearing different views and different perspectives and different approaches to a very similar topic. And, and again, to your point, uh, we all experience uh, either a lack of or a, uh, a, a bounty of psychological safety at some point in our lives. We, we just do. It's, it's, it's a part of the human experience. And it's nice to have folks like you to take us, uh, take us on the journey and, and help us along the way. So again, thanks, thanks very much for sharing. Uh, if, if you're watching this episode, on the Flourish DX YouTube page, please do like, subscribe, and share. Uh, we'd love to have other folks uh, figure out this conversation and get involved. If you're watching or listening to this podcast for the first time, welcome. I hope something that you've heard will bring you back in the future. Previous episodes of the podcast can be found at psychhealthandsafetyusa.com. We'd also like to uh, in, uh, invite you to become a part of the Psych Health and Safety USA movement by connecting to us on LinkedIn as well. And uh, we thank you for the gift of your time. Until next time, the next episode of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. Thanks very much. Tune in each Friday for new episodes of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. If you have a story or know of one that needs to be told, reach out to us on LinkedIn or send an email to david at id2-solutions.com or go to the Flourish DX website at flourishdx.com. We'll see you next time.